Chairman of the MPI Board of Directors and Senior Vice President of Corporate Hotel Sales at MGM Resorts International, Mr. Michael Dominguez. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I officially get to welcome you to Las Vegas, and I can tell you that for those of you that are here, it's a little lighter than yesterday, so you've done a good job of surviving your first night in Las Vegas, so welcome, because um, we know what Vegas is all about. Uh, we, we, with MPI, we were very proud to uh, have Smart Monday yesterday and be one of the premier educators, uh, driving professionalism and professional development within our industry. So this is something we take to heart, we're very proud of. and. Remember, we'll have a keynote session every, every day uh, coming up over the next couple of days. If you miss Smart Monday, we're also going to be having sessions in our Inspiration Center on the floor. And then the MPI Foundation has actually released some really great research. Uh, the SMM study just came out as well uh, this week, and that information will be released in our booth. So please stop by the MPI booth if you're interested in some more information. Really good uh, research for you, and hopefully will help in your professional development. With that, I just want to say thank you for your commitment. Uh, thank you for your professional growth. If you ever have stage fright, by the way, just come stand up here because you can't see anybody with these lights. Um, I'm trying to make eye contact, and I am blind. Uh, but I do have the distinct uh, privilege and honor um, to introduce our host uh, and uh, the chairman of IMAX, uh, Mr. Ray Bloom, who I have a privilege of calling my friend. Please. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I have the same view as Mike, by the way, of all of you. Um, welcome. Today's opening day of the third IMAX America. Delighted to have all of you with us. As Mike um, just said, yesterday was Smart Monday. It was very successful. Um, the participation was very strong, and the feedback that we've received has been really excellent. We're very pleased, of course, and cherish our partnership, our strategic partnership with MPI. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that my good friend Mike Dominguez is the chair this year. Um, we love working with Mike and with all of his colleagues and all of the staff at MPI. And I'd like to wish Mike all the very best for the remainder of his term as the chair. IMAX America this year has grown. Um, you will see significant growth on the show floor, and indeed we're in different halls to previously. The hosted bio program has also grown, as have the appointments made prior to the show with the buyers together with the suppliers. In fact, the numbers on the appointments are up by over 25%. You're looking at a number now that's touching on 50,000. So there's going to be a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. Um, additionally, um, I'd like also to mention something that you're all going to notice, those who have here, been here in the past, is the renovation of the Sands Expo, the lead into the exhibition hall. It's really stunning. There's been a major investment here by the Sands, so we both thank them and congratulate them on what they've done. We're really pleased and thrilled to have our home here in Las Vegas. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to our partners here, the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, who again, one could not have a finer partner. They're available and help us at every stage. They've been like that from the second we announced we were going to launch the show. And it, this applies not just to LVCVA, but actually to the whole of Las Vegas, taking into account not just this property, but all of the properties in the city. So at this point, I take great pleasure in introducing our keynote sponsor today. It's from Philadelphia. It's Julie Coker. She is Senior Vice President for the Convention Division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitor Authority. Please welcome Julie to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Ray. I say good morning, although it is 12 o'clock to my body on the East Coast, so I don't know whether I want a bagel or if I want a cheesesteak. <laughs> I feel like I'm leaning more towards a cheesesteak, though. Uh, it is with my pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce Eileen Mc McDar, our keynote for today. It's no wonder why we, Philadelphia, deli are delighted to set the stage for radical resiliency message. Change is the name of the game, not only in our industry, but also in our personal and professional lives. Resiliency takes many dimensions. How do we stay right side up in a world that often seems upside down? Our opening speaker helps us explore just that question. 
She has a ton of information, so she's asked me not to go on and on about her credentials. You have the opportunity to actually meet her today. She's doing a book signing at the MPI booth, which is 3009 from 1030 a.m. to 11 a.m., 1130 a.m. As she said, it's not a matter of importance of what she's done, but it's more important of what she's going to do for us today. She's going to give us much to think about, talk about, and laugh about. Ideas to help us bloom where we are planted. Please welcome the author of five books, a Hall of Fame speaker, and the lover of all things dark chocolate, a woman after my own heart, from California, Eileen McDar. Hey, while you're standing, if you feel so inclined and want to smooch in a little bit, because you are going to have to talk to each other at some point in time here. So if you're sitting far, far away, you might want to get up close and personal. So as my friends in New Jersey would say, let's talk. <laughs> now, I know when I started that music, there will be some people in here who thought, I can't believe she's making me do this. Doesn't she know that for Las Vegas, this is really early in the morning? How many of you had a great time last night? Thank you for being able to even raise your hand. <laughs> but I, I wanted to play that music for a very specific reason. Um, and I know that it does come from one of the darker parts of music history, disco. How many of us remember disco? How many of us would like to forget disco? <laughs> Do you remember you had the multi-levels of gold chains, the um, polyester print shirts, the four-inch platform shoes, and those were just the guys? <laughs> but it's the words. So let me update the words of Sister Sledge. We are family. I have all my sisters and brothers with me. And we are very much a practice community family. That's how we gather. That is the collective that gathers here at IMEX3. And as practice community families, no one understands better than the world of the meeting industries and the people who are here. No one knows better than the people who are here what have been the ups and downs, the trials and the tribulations of the last eight to five plus years within this business. We've seen that whole economic turmoil five years ago. AIG effect for us meant absolutely instantly gone. And if you look at the recent statistics, the ICCA, their most recent uh, survey, global survey, said that there was projections that for 2014 we would see more meetings, we would have greater attendance. That was before the federal government in Washington decided to sit on its hands. And I now call Washington, D.C. the land of the frozen chosen. <laughs> we have no idea what impact that will have, but it will, in fact, attach our resilient spirits. And as a practice community family, we also have our own language, we have our own buzzwords, we have our own role models, our heroes like Ray Bloom, like my friend Ed Scannell down here, former past president of MPI, and we also have our own acronyms. I thought I would share with you the name of some of the family members who gather here at IMEX. Here they go. A-C-T-E, A-D-M-E, A-M-C-I, A-S-A-A, E-C-M, F-I-C-P, G-M-I-C, D-M-A-I, plus A-I-C-C-A-I-E-E, A-I-P-C-O, I-C-C-A, I-S-C-S, J-M-I-C-P-A-T-A, S-K-A-L, and SPIN. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> but wait, that's not all. You realize, of course, Smart Monday is sponsored through MPI, and many of its members are CMPs, and we are joined with our CV, CVB brothers and sisters, we've got the CICs, and of course there is PCMA, which also stands for Professional Crisis Management Association. And how many of you have had a couple days where you think, I'm a member? <laughs> I'm, I'm a member here. And all of us, all of our clients are asking us to be conscious in our events and whatever we plan that we pay attention to CSR. And they also want ROI. And you better figure out how to do it PDQ or you will be SOL. 
And for those of you who have no clue what I just said, come find me in the MPI booth and I will tell you. I am part of the practice community that comes from NSA, not to be confused with the other NSA. <laughs> we are the talkers, they are the listeners. <laughs> Which actually brings up something else that will impact us within the meetings industry, technology. I mean, look at all the technology that has surrounded this conference. I mean, from the time you checked in, all of the social media that has been used, when you go out on that trade show floor, you're going to see more technology. There's a little robot that's going to be running around. You know, we've got a telegraphic uh, telepresence, holographic images, and all of the sessions about hybrid meetings and how do you use technology to bring people closer and closer together. And not only is it going to be the technology, but also what our physical arrangements look like. I thought I would show you, whether you're in a large meeting or an intimate meeting, those top two pictures, that is the Pennsylvania Convention Center, the Philadelphia Visitors and Convention Bureau. They've spent almost $800 million in renovation and expansion, and built into that was to be able to take advantage of the technology within that area. Those bottom two pictures is more like a boutique setting. It's Meet Las Vegas. It is in downtown Las Vegas. And it was designed from the get-go in order to have rigorous technology. In fact, you can even change what that building looks like on the outside based upon the theme of the meeting that is being, that is being held there. But even as I say all of that about technology, I'm not sure it's made our lives simpler. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, this, um, this was a plane that a relative of mine flew in World War II. There were only seven items on the checklist of that plane. I'm not sure how many are on this one. <laughs> but here's what I know. Sometimes low tech works just as well. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I love this slide. I'm going to keep this slide. Some of you will never even recognize that phone. But you know, you've got a limited budget. You can't afford a Bluetooth or you can't afford a headset, rubber band, and a big phone works just well. Uh, <laughs> But here's the, the one I really love. It's this cartoon. Technology advances, people stay the same. Will you notice the coffee cup? <laughs> How many of us have done that? <laughs> coffee cup, briefcase, kid in a car seat, put it in. You see, I think this says everything about us as a human system. That this notion of resiliency is how do we take what is our wonderful, brilliant best, and it's sometimes we're just not as brilliant as we should be, and we do things like the coffee cup. So when I talk about this notion of radical resiliency, by the way, I did not give you a handout. I do hope you take notes. I know that in the area of adult education, if you don't write anything down, by the time you put your head on the bed tonight, you will have lost about two-thirds of what you came to get. But I also created for you, if you go to my website, as long as you can spell my name, you can get there. It's in the program, EileenMacDar.com forward slash IMEX, make sure it's all capital letters. I put on there, it's a page just for you. There's a whole series of articles that I've written about resiliency so that you can download them, give them to your colleagues, use them so that the learning, that the learning can continue. Well, let me tell you what I think resiliency is not. I don't think it's this. It is not bounce back. That's why I call it radical. I don't think there's going back. The dictionary defines it as back. But that's fine if you have a, a piece of wire that bends, but not for the human system. And I think now resiliency is needed in all parts of our lives. And I define it as the ability to grow through challenge or opportunity, and you end up wiser and better on the other side. So we need it in all parts of our life. I think now this is a living skill. So when I think about the notion of resiliency, I think there are four traits that a resilient leader has. The first one is adaptability. They say, Eileen, of course, we have to be adaptable. Everybody has that. It's the two words underneath it that makes it bigger. Requisite variety. Requisite variety says that the organism with the greatest number of responses to any situation is the one that survives. In other words, it's not enough to have just one other thing to do. I want to find as many options for myself. Now let me give you an example of what happens if you don't have a lot of options. Years and years ago, this piece of research came across my desk that said passion and hunger produce the same look on a man's face. 
So when I shared that with the audience, and you can tell it was years and years ago, I had spoken to a corporate group, and they said, would you address the spouses? And all of the spouses were women. They were all wives. So as I shared that piece of research, passion and hunger produced the same look on a man's face. Someone sitting oh, right about there where you are looked up at me in absolute horror and said, do you mean to tell me I could have just fed him? <laughs> That is not requisite variety. <laughs> so I spent some time talking about how do we increase our adaptability. Here's another skill. The next skill is agility. Agility, speed, coupled with wisdom. How fast can I get that the world has changed around me? And how can I respond to that? The third skill, I think it's an important skill, is laughability. Laughter is a great resiliency skill. It allows us to put things in perspective. And the fourth one is alignment. How can I stay centered on what's important for me? Now, what I want to do with those four skills is I want to superimpose them over top of a model. Some of you will recognize this model. It was the old Johari window. It's a model for group interaction created back in the 50s. It's, it's great. I still use it when I do work with intact work teams. But what I want to do is I have recreated this for how do we think differently in a world that is constantly going to be changing around us. So let me take this first thing, this common knowledge quadrant. These are the things that you and I know. It's the way you operate business. If you are an incentive, if you are in the incentive business, you know how you package things. If you are one of the event planners, you know how you package things. The problem is if I only stay with what I currently know, my ability to respond to a world that is changing is no bigger than that. So how do I make it bigger? There's a couple ways. The first one is I might want to blow up that common knowledge block. And the way I blow it up is I ask myself some questions. What am I thinking? What if we tried this? Why not? And who says so? So let me give you some examples of common knowledge and how we might want to challenge them. And I'll take them out of, the, out of the hospitality field. All right, this is an audience participation one. I want you to shout out to me, what are the colors of washcloths in hotels? Right. right. Except if you were at the Seaport Hotel opposite the Boston Convention Center, in addition to the white washcloths, there is one black washcloth. And embroidered over it, Makeup. <laughs> Who says that washcloths have to be white? All right. How many of you, now this is going to date me, how many of you remember that if you were accused of sleeping around, this was not a good thing? <laughs> All right. Let me give you a variation on this theme of sleeping around. I'm going to show you sleeping around. You talk about how do I look at things differently. This is a cargo container from China. And the company, you Google sleeping around, it will bring you here. It is a company that has said, you know, the cargo containers, when they come from China, they, they sit in rust. What could we do with them? It's actually like a little pop-up hotel. And so they have fitted it with everything that you need, every kind of comfort that you have. It is currently parked at a pier in Antwerp. So if you wanted to go have a different experience in Antwerp and something that was recycled that normally would have been thrown away, here's a whole new meaning to the term sleeping around. In fact, when we think about recycling and using things differently in CSR, you will have an opportunity for the rest of this conference to go to this booth 1664 and when you think about the bars of soap that, are, uh, that you know, are slimy and we use them for two times and they're gone and the shampoos, this organization, Clean the World, has said, what if we would create hygiene kits that takes what is not used totally and how could we redo it? You can go and participate in this. And by the way, the hygiene kits will be going to Shade Tree, which is a shelter for women and children here within the Vegas area. It's another way of looking at what we normally would have thrown away and saying, how could we make this more? Now, what fascinates me about this common knowledge is I work with organizations. Why don't we challenge what we know? And I think a couple things get in our way. One of the things that gets in our way, frankly, is that we don't know how to create strategic partnerships. When you go out on that trade floor and you do your speed dating for the meetings industry, <laughs> this is what it's going to feel like, begin to ask yourself, 
how can I look at someone who might have been considered a competitor and could we create a strategic partnership? And my framework for strategic partnership is what could we do together that we cannot do apart? What could we do together that we cannot do apart? Let me show you an example of a strategic partnership. This was at a DMI, DMAI conference I addressed, and there were these three CVBs, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, and that latter one is Portland, Oregon. Where are my people from Portland? Got any Portland people? Hey, there we go. So what they did is they shared a booth, and if you think about it, meetings are booked a couple years out. So the concept that they decided is, well, why don't you just move your meeting across the U.S.? You can start, you can start in Pittsburgh, then next year you can move to Milwaukee, and lo and behold, you can end up on the Columbia River in Portland, Oregon. A strategic partnership. Let me show you one even larger. Now, the slide is not that great, so I'll have to explain. what This is the country of Germany. And when you go out on the trade show, you're going to see this map of Germany, and what they've done is they have said, okay, instead of competing with each other, how do we make it so that our potential buyers can find out what matches them best? So they've taken the country, and they have divided it up into sectors, sectors that will show you where are specific educational components, what is the technology that's available, and if you look at these different sectors, how can that sector, that location, match where my potential meeting might go? So they gave you a way of looking at an entire country from a totally different perspective. I think that's, that's fascinating. But here's what holds us back, red ants. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have negative people in your life? May I see a show of hands? You say white, they say black. You say up, they say down. They'll tell you why everything is wrong. Nothing will sap your ability to be resilient more than this negativity. I have a relative, an aunt in my life, who is one of those negative people. That if you told her it was the land of milk and honey, she'd say, no, it's not. It's calories and cholesterol. <laughs> and my sister and I got my, my twin brother, John, by the way, when I meet you, you will see I'm short. I come by it genetically. Half of me is a professor at Boston College. <laughs> we take my aunt and we go to upstate New York to England, New England, where the wonderful fall colors are coming in right now. They'll be peaking and moving down. And we're driving the back roads, and suddenly my sister said, oh, wait, let's stop the car. I want to get out. I want to take a picture of those wonderful leaves in that blue sky and that weather vane. She hops out of the car, and in a heartbeat, my aunt says, well, I hope she didn't stand in red ants. Do you know how hard you have to work to even think of that? <laughs> now, here's the scary thought. It could be genetic. <laughs> so here's what, I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the people sitting next to you, and I want you to make this motion, and I want you to say to them, no red ants, right now. No red ants. No red ants. Look at each other. No red ants. All right, now hold it up in front of your own nose. No red ants. You go on to that trade show, you start talking to your colleagues, and you have people going, oh, well, that's a thing. <laughs> this might sound dumb, but I got to tell you, when I teach this to groups, it anchors that thought in their head, and they go around, they go, no red ants. Now, here's something that will help you with the red ants, is if we could practice intelligent optimism. Intelligent optimism says, how can I take an event, and how can I reframe it? in such a way that I see what is possible, not what is impossible. And one of the most dramatic examples of that, I believe, has to do with this little guy. This is the blind salamander. Actually, I'll give you a, a close-up of the blind salamander. It, <laughs> it lives in the Edwards Aquifer, which is underneath the city of San Antonio, Texas. I want you to know, since 1984, the e Environmental Protection Agency told the city of San Antonio, you may not take any more water than you're currently doing out of the aquifer. The city of San Antonio practiced intelligent optimism and said, how can we use that to our advantage? San Antonio is now one of the most water precious con conservation cities in the United States. It is using the same amount of water it used in 84, even though it has 2 million more people. And every child in San Antonio, at least to my understanding, can tell you what the water table is in that aquifer. They have figured out how to turn it around. 
So when you look at some of the events, how can I practice intelligent optimism? Intelligent optimism. Here's something else that I think sometimes holds us back, the past. We love it. We love it. It's so wonderful. And we're not even sometimes aware that we're hanging on to stuff that no longer serves us in our profession or in our personal lives. Let me ask a question. How many of you go to exercise on a regular basis? An exercise class, a class. Let me see a show of hands. Okay, sir, I see your name. And you are, your name? I'm Benny. Benny? Okay, do we know each other? I thought so. He looked very familiar. All right, Benny, let's hope, let's hope you play this one right. Benny, when you go to the exercise class, do you have your spot on the floor? Absolutely, Absolutely he says. And what happens if someone's on your spot on the floor? He tries to move them out of the way. Oh, out of the way here, buddy. That's my spot. Those of you in exercise class, can you identify? If we get that rigid with where we stand on an exercise floor, guess how rigid we can be, and we're not even conscious of it. I want to show you a sign. My husband was in the hospitality field, managed country clubs. This is an old sign. I think now they've actually taken it out, thankfully. But I want you to look at the sign and think how many people walk past this sign on a golf course and absolutely never saw it. Any person except players caught collecting golf balls on this course will be prosecuted and have their balls removed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> when you walk back in your individual places of employee, I want you to look and say, what is the sign I'm not seeing? What is the stuff I'm not, what is it that I am not looking at? And by the way, just because you change something doesn't mean that you can't go back. I wanted to put this up because those of you who are with MPI know that for the past five years, the, the magazine was called one plus the little plus sign. And then they realized that, that name meant nothing to the professionals who were part of the industry. And they went back to call it the Meeting Professional Magazine. So just because you try something doesn't mean that Maybe you do want to go back. Maybe there is a practice that you left for the sake of change, and it doesn't really serve anymore. So if I can blow up that common knowledge block, now here's another way in which I can practice more adaptability, is to find out what other people know that I don't know. And the degree to which I am willing to find out what you can share with me, then my ability, my requisite variety gets larger. And I think, though, one of the things is that we need to look for viewing points versus a viewpoint. A viewpoint is that singular way of looking at something. And I wanted to visually show you, this is a mountain that I like to climb behind Santa Barbara. It's a four-mile hike from sea level up to the top of the mountain. Now, if I look out to sea level, I have a, a, a beautiful picture. It is a viewpoint. Look what I would miss if I did not turn around. Radically different picture, isn't it? It's the Los Padres National Forest. So here's, here's my question for all of us. Who do I need to talk to that can show me something that I don't see? And I'll tell you what I think it takes for that kind of adaptability. I think it takes courage. It takes a lot of courage to admit I don't have all the answers. Sometimes those answers are inside of me and I don't pay attention to them. How many of you know that we have screwed up when you didn't listen to your own intuition? Your own gut, you knew it, see, we knew it. And we didn't, we didn't listen to it. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity right now to make a new friend. How many of you are sitting next to people that you know right now? Okay, I got all my Philly people here. Okay, I want you to stand up and find someone. You, you might have to turn around and I know you can't move very, find someone you don't know right now. And, it, and when you found the person you don't know, just put your hand up. Just turn around, whatever you have to do. Put your hand up so I know you got a partner. You guys got a partner? You don't know each other? All right. All right, listen up. Oh, this gentleman needs a partner. Okay. Shh. All right. I want you to look at your... Look at your new partner very carefully. Study them up and down. You're going to have to find them again, and they might be wearing different clothes. <laughs> Unless I got stuck at the tables. All right, now raise your right hand. Looking at your partner, not at me. You are taking the IMEX pledge. Repeat after me. I promise, before I leave this conference, 
to find you again. And, and to ask you to give me one piece of advice for a situation I'm dealing with right now. Cross my heart and hope to spit. <laughs> Shake hands with your new person and sit down. Now I know you have a lot of appointments, you have a lot of meetings, but I guarantee you when we talk to someone who is totally unknown to us, you might be amazed as what they come up with. And you obviously, you trade it with each other. And if, at the very least, trade business cards and call each other if you can't do it while you're here in Vegas. And by the way, if your new person gives you an idea, don't say, oh, that's a dumb, stupid idea. <laughs> OK? All right, because the truth, of the, the truth of the matter is we're all in the same boat. We want, we want this industry to thrive. And the more it can thrive because we support and encourage each other, that's part of what's involved in the practice community within that family. So if I, if I do these things, all right, so now I want to talk about I've got adaptability, I've got agility. Here's the next one. The next one has to do with agility is this quadrant, revelation and risk. This is where there are things that you know. The degree to which you are willing to risk and speak your truth, but even more so, act from your truth. Now, here's something. If you want to tweet this, you can tweet this. By the, na by the way, it's hashtag MacDarling is my Twitter handle. M-A-C, darling, M-A-C, darling. To know and not to do is not to know. To know and not to do is not to know. So if you know something, what are some of the actions that you can take? Because I think in a world of change, action is the anecdote for anxiety. You start to feel anxious about what's going on, put something in motion. The minute you begin to put it in motion, you begin to feel that you have a sense of control. It might be very small. It might be that you change the name of a magazine, and maybe two years later you change it back. But put something in action, and that is a risk for all of us. I learned about putting things in action, frankly, from this experience. And this experience came from trekking one of the remote regions of the Indian, they say Himalayas, some people say Himalayas, uh, with a colleague of mine who some of you might have heard last year at Smart Monday, Jeff Sauls, an anthropology colleague. So we joined Jeff for a trek to India. This is one of the glaciers. Uh, glaciers feed the waters of India. And we are told on this trek, we're up to about 16,000 feet, that we are going to have to cross three whitewater rivers on foot. We're also told you better get to them early in the morning because what happens is that the glaciers free, refreeze at night. And as they do, the water levels come down. But as soon as the sun starts to rise, the water levels come up. So we got through the first river okay. Here is the second river. We had crossed this river about 15 minutes before our crew and the pack animals came across. I want you to look at where the water level is on those animals. Because for me, that would probably be about here. And it is, when they say white water, they mean white water. And what happened was that we needed to throw a rope to the crew. We got the animals across, but now we got the crew on the other side. As we were attempting to get this crew across, I actually thought we were going to lose this man. We didn't get them across. They had to spend the night on that rock pile in below freezing temperatures. And I learned three things about action just from that experience. Here are the three lessons that I got. Don't wait. Don't wait. While you're waiting to figure out some things right now that are going in your life, it might be too late and the water can rise. Take some kind of action now. The second one is to face what you fear and move forward. One of our colleagues, when we cross the river, the way you cross is that you actually, you stagger it. So like there would be one big guy and me and another big person. And you don't hold hands. You actually hold your wrist like this. And one of our party, for some unknown reason, slipped and fell. When they brought her up, 
She had her back to the rapids. Now you look. What happens? And I remember, I'm standing on the bank of that river, screaming at her, face it, face it. And all of a sudden, I lean. What are you not willing to face? It was such a big aha for me. And I also realized that what made you stronger when that water was coming is that you literally leaned into it. You leaned into that water. So what is it that you're looking at right now that you need to lean into? Because that will give you strength. And this last one to me came when I kept thinking, those guys, they didn't make it across. Why didn't they? This is their village. They know this. They had become too comfortable. They had taken the water for granted. If you are very successful in what you do, beware. When we become too comfortable, that's when it could become dangerous. So it's that little bit of edge at that constant improvement, that constant learning. That's what I mean by agility, being able to respond with what you see in these ways. What will happen then is that we'll hear from words of wisdom like Karina. I don't know if any of you have happened to meet Karina yet. When I interviewed her, she said, and this fit perfectly, perfectly with risk and revelation. Look at this. Be outward facing. Take risk. Be collaborative. I loved her line. We need to see past the walls that we put around our enterprises. See, we, we have our walls, and, and we only talk to people who are in other industries, or things just like us, and we, we miss. I thought that was a wonderful piece of wisdom from her. If I can do that for agility, then what happens is I move to the fourth quadrant. The fourth quadrant is, I think, where the future lies, creative opportunity. There are things that none of us know what will exist. I mean, who knew that five years ago we would be able to do with technology that we're doing now? We had absolutely no clue, did we? Had no clue. And yet here we can do these things. But the way I have to get there is I first have to challenge common knowledge. I have to find out what other people know that I don't know, and I have to be willing to risk. What will help us move to that fourth quadrant are the last two skills. The third skill was laughability. Laughter is the shortest distance between two people. It is what allows us to keep on keeping on. I hope you like this uh, little cartoon that I brought, the Adult Rehab Center. We know that people who laugh on the job are more creative, more productive, willing to work longer hours. That's where, that's where innovation comes. I mean, how many of you want to work with people who look like they were weaned on a pickle? <laughs> Came to work with tight underwear. <laughs> By the way, I've seen some desk clerks like this. This is not a pretty, good morning. <laughs> What's good about it? Ooh. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can sleep in another room here. So uh, how do we create that? And I think laughter is such an incredible, valuable skill. And there is so much that we can, I mean, I'll bet you if you guys sat and talked this evening about funny things that you've seen some of the people do around you, you would keep laughing the whole, the whole time. I mean, even looking at some, I love this, even looking at some signs. This is a sign I saw. I mean, it might be handy, you know, here, Mom, just go through the, you know. <laughs> they're already wrinkled, who cares, you know, all of a steam dry, it doesn't make any, make any difference. This, I mean, you have to laugh. This is a sign that I saw, I was speaking in Canada, and this is a sign I saw, it just cracked me up. Chainsaw, promo, wedding supplies. <laughs> Which came first? <laughs> I mean, you you have to you just have to laugh at these things. I um I had this this greeting card that I found and it was um my aunt is um she is a nun and um she does have a sense of humor when she's not being negative and it was her birthday and this this greeting card was in the full nun habit and it talked you pressed a button right here on the greeting card and it said a couple of things one was that'll be 45 our fathers and 10 Hail Marys <laughs> another one said I know what you did and I'm praying for your soul <laughs> and I actually knew she'd laugh at that so I send it off to her and then <laughs> I got to thinking, what about the postal carrier who reaches in and picks up that envelope? I know what you did, and I'm praying for your soul. <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> you, just, you just have to laugh at some of this stuff. And the other thing that laughability will do, when we reach a critical point, when there's something that's not going right, it's when we can find some humor about it that it can absolutely transform it. Uh, let, me give you, let me give you two examples. One was I was on a, um, a, a small cruise ship that was taking us up to the inland passageway off of outside of Alaska. And it was the only ship that had permission to anchor in Glacier Bay. So it could hold about, 20, about 24 people. And as we we're going up the bay, they put the anchor out and it fell off. They lost the anchor. So we're, we're not up to Glacier Bay yet, but you can't anchor in Glacier Bay if you ain't got no anchor. And so they had to figure out how to solve this problem. So they, they put the, the, the small ship over. There's a dock at um, Glacier Bay National Park. And they sent us off with a ranger to do a day exploration while they're trying to figure out what are we going to do about missing an anchor. When we came back on board, the crew on this ship had created an Anchors Away party. They were dressed in costume. I don't know where they got those costumes. They slapped wigs on us. They had drinks that they called different things that were based upon Anchor Away, and then told us we were going to do a detour, and they were going to go to an Indian village, and there was a local diver who had the full-on helmet suit that could go down and bring up the... But look how they turned what was negative. So they practiced intelligent optimism, and they transformed it by making it fun. 13 years ago, I stayed at a hotel outside of, uh, outside of O'Hare. Now, I'm not going to give you the name of the hotel because I actually I tried to go back and find it, and I think it has changed hands. But I was there on Halloween, and I, the taxi drops me off, and here are hundreds of kids in costume running into this hotel. I mean, I got ninja turtles and princesses and knights and... Ninja turtle, yeah, ninja turtles and ninja warriors. I had both, turtles and warriors. Yeah, you know, I had, uh, one little kid was dressed up like an Oreo cookie. It was the cutest thing I ever saw. They were, they can tell it was a long time ago. They were Teletubbies. Um, and when I went in, the whole, the, the, the front desk was just all in costume. Everything was fast tuned. And I said, what the heck is going on here? They said, well, Eileen, we had, we had low bed count over Halloween. So what we decided to do was that we went out to the independent living centers for seniors. And we asked for volunteers. And here's what we said. Would you be willing to come and spend one night in our hotel and have one meal on us if you will decorate the door of your sleeping room for Halloween and pass out candy that we will give you to the kids? Then they went to all of the, the preschools and elementary schools and said, come and have a party with us. And they told me, you, you can't stay on the second or the third floor because those are reserved for the, for the seniors. I have to tell you, it was the most amazing experience I have ever seen. You have never seen such joy rocking off of a hotel on Halloween. They had, the mayor showed up dressed like Minnie Mouse. They had, you can tell this was a long time ago because they had popcorn. We didn't have popcorn and we had hot dogs. We didn't have to worry about gluten-free and vegetarian and all this other stuff. The kids were having, they had face painting. And then I followed a group of these kids with their parents as they walked down the hall. And it was so cute to watch these little kids in safety. It was cold and rainy outside. It's wonderful inside. Knock on the door. And here were the seniors who opened it up. I'll never forget one woman was wearing a burlap bag. And she'd put a sign across the front that said, I'm the old bag. <laughs> now, I've got to tell you, I think that was pretty darn clever. Negative thing, you got low bed count, and it was in a residential community. So now you've gone out to the community and you said, now when they think about where do you want to have a wedding? Where do you want to have a bar mitzvah? Where do you want to go? For? I now have a hotel that belongs to me. Because they took it, I thought it was genius myself. Now, when I say it can also help you when things are negative, I thought I'd share one on myself. Uh, two years ago, I was brought in to speak, asked to speak for 100 senior women executives for a professional services corporation. So these senior women executives, they're CEOs, CIOs, CTOs, you name it, and they're from, they're from around the globe. And the professional services company had taken over the Montage Hotel. Uh, for those of you who are not from Southern California, the Montage is, how many of you know the Montage? 
gorgeous, huge property, and you can imagine what it cost to take over the montage, which was absolutely lovely because that's only like about five miles from my house. And they very kindly said, you can come and stay if you'd like. Oh, I think I will. <laughs> could do that. The problem was, about 10 days before I was to speak, this tooth fell out. It, it's a crown. It totally came out. So I go to the dentist, and he's trying to do this temporary, and the temporary, we thought it would hold, but it wouldn't hold. And two days before I'm supposed to speak, he said, you have to have a bone graft. And then you come in on that morning, I'm not supposed to start that afternoon. You come in on that morning, and we'll see if it works. Well, I, I can look at the look on your face. I'm terrified. I thought, what am I... What am I, I mean, I look like Johnny Depp's evil twin sister from Pirates of the Caribbean. What am I going to do? So I had to have some fallback plan. So this was my fallback. So some things are designed to test your resiliency, like this. I think I'm going to bed. I've had enough. What's happening? He's cute, though. <laughs> I'm not ticklish. You. You're welcome. <laughs> That'll be $25.99. No. <laughs> anyway, so I actually have kept this, because I think it's actually a good reminder for myself, though I live in terror that one day I will fall and it's going to fall out again. It's just going to be just going to be horrible. So. Um, if I, if I talk about then adaptability, agility, laughability, let's talk about alignment. Alignment really to me is the secret to resiliency and sustainability. And the picture that I have up here for you is a picture of taken on that same trek, that whitewater trek. There is a pop in that, isn't it? You, know, you okay with the sound? It's okay with the sound? All right. That is a very, very old monastery. And if you look at that rugged terrain, it's closed for about eight months out of the year to snow. The reason it can remain standing is that it is anchored in bedrock. So when I think about what is it that anchors us, I wanted to put it in perspective and in context. And it really has to do with this plane. You see, what I didn't tell you when I put that plane up is that the person who flew that plane was my mother. My mother was one of the 1,076 women Air Force Service pilots, called WASP, who paid their own way onto an air base into Sweetwater, Texas, and took over all the domestic flying for the military in World War II. It's, it's an amazing story. They flew 60 million air miles of domestic wartime duty. In fact, this coming November 6th at the Women's War Memorial in DC, we will have a premiere of a PBS documentary that, that I helped a producer create on their story. And you can look for it on Veterans Day on some of your PBS networks. It'll play on various PBX networks. But they, these women were incredible. It was not without hazard, 38 of them died in the course of duty. But because they were not considered official military, there were no benefits, and in at least one case, they had to pass the hat to send the body home to the parents. They were disbanded shortly before the war was over, and women were not allowed back in the cockpits of military planes again for 30 years. I thought you... Um, might like to see a, a picture of my precious little mom. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> um, uh, I lost her. I lost her a year ago. It's a it's a big hole in my heart. But it, let me tell you why I show this to you. Because for 30 years, not only were women not allowed in the cockpits of military planes, the Air Force even forgot that they existed. The records weren't sealed, but pretty much closed and put away. And in the late 1970s, the Air Force announced, oh, we're going to let women fly for the first time. And these wasps all of a sudden said, wait, wait, what, 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 what were we, chopped liver? And they began to meet. 
And every two years, they would gather at cities around the United States. They always had to have a good air base that was close to them because they would go over to that airfield and see what was the newest, the latest, the greatest. And because of that, when they would meet, and by the way, they were finally in 2010 awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for their service. But when they would meet, women just like this would come, would talk to them, would sit at their feet and say, tell me the story. If, if you did it, maybe I can do it. I want you to hear that word. They would meet. They would come together. They couldn't have done this through technology, even if it had existed. It was the coming together that made the difference. You see, I think that's what's so incredibly important about this industry. For all of the wonders of technology, it is what we do when we come face to face that has the opportunity to break barriers, to build bridges, to create relationships, and yes, even to make history. That is why I am so incredibly happy to be part of this incredible practice community. Because you see, we do make a difference. I think that is our alignment. Without those meetings, we become less and the world becomes more and more fractured. That's why we do it. Because the truth of the matter is, we are all family.